For those who've been coming regularly to this stage all day, this has been a stage that's been focusing on Earth, the environment, and what changes we can make. And this final panel, in a way, is a sort of resolution to that. It's about climate restoring technology. Um, we're going to have a fireside chat. Uh, there is no fireside because uh, that's eco ecologically polluting, so you're just going to have to imagine one. Um, and we're going to be, uh, the session's going to be led by Anthony Hobley, who is uh, the chief executive, or has been the chief executive officer of the Carbon Tracker Initiative for the last five years and has just recently moved up to being co chair. And he's going to uh, open with the discussion with Ibrahim Al Husseini of Full Cycle. Over to you, Anthony. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I think I, I, I'll be honest, I know very little about AI um, and machine learning, but I'm hearing in the world of climate change, I'm hearing more and more about the potential. So my own organization that I recently stepped down as CEO of um, has just won a grant uh, with, from Google for its work using AI machine learning to take data from satellites, which can effectively monitor in real time the world's power stations. So to actually know how much carbon dioxide those power stations are putting into the atmosphere um, at the click of a button. And we are now beginning to talk about a global satellite system that will be able to gather that data. And again, we, with the use of AI and machine learning, provide real-time coverage of the world's emissions. You know, we, we've all heard about the climate emergency, the climate crisis, the children's school stri strikes kicked off by Greta Thunberg, um, and the Extinction Rebellion. We'll have seen, many of us will have seen the impacts of that, perhaps even taken part in that, um, in London. And in 2015, we got the groundbreaking Paris Agreement which commits us to net zero emissions by 2050 and to try and get us on a pathway between two, you know, two degrees and one and a half degrees of global warming. Yet I think most of you will be staggered that even with this crisis, the mechanism for understanding the emissions is based on a paper gathering exercise by each government. And each government is then required to submit its national emissions three years after they occurred. And there's all kinds of complex rules that effectively, you know, governments could, and they never do that, do they, could, could choose to fudge um, and give themselves extra capacity. With satellites and AI and machine learning, this is one area where we, we could actually empower all of us to know exactly what those emissions are, what the cement industry's emissions were in China yesterday, um, and I think this is critical, because imagine what a Greta Thunberg and the Extinction Rebellion could do with that data. And I think in many ways, technology, and we'll hear from, from two people on the panel here about the power of technology, it really you know, has the potential to provide a solution. And I think many people, are technologists, are telling us we have the technology, we are just not implementing it at the speed and scale that is required. And perhaps, Ibrahim, we can start, we can start there. I mean, we, we, we've all known we've got a major problem with climate change and, and the resource constraints that our planet faces. But quite frankly, we've all been a little bit sort of relaxed about it, haven't we? But I think this year, it feels like there's a change in the zeitgeist. The language has changed. We've, we've gone from global warming, and climate change and the energy transition, which all sounds very nice and, and very sort of relaxed, to a climate crisis, to a climate emergency. Do you, do you think that change in language is important? And, and what do you think it means? Um, I think it's so important that they changed it from global warming to climate change to cool it down for a while. The special interests that have a vested interest in prolonging our addiction to fossil fuels needed a language change to make it seem not like an emergency, not like a crisis. Like, hey, the planet changes over time. There were glaciers, now they're not. 
this is a natural cycle, don't worry about it. Climate change is natural and it happens. And that was the point of that ex exercise. And I'm sad to say it was my uh, country that impregnated the zeitgeist with that um, language, climate change. And it was a deliberate point to make it sound less scary and more benign. So yes, language is very important. And I'm glad that we're finally calling it the emergency or the disruption or the uh, crisis, crisis that it is. You're someone who follows the, the science very closely from our conversations. So as you say, the climate has changed in the past, but not anywhere near the speed that we're currently, well, we're currently causing. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, put it into context. Yeah, so, um, so it's fascinating, right? It's fascinating that there is a whole, you know, multi-trillion dollar industry whose vested interest is to prolong their profits from fossil fuels, right? Like that's, that's their mandate, they've subscribed to it, that's what they think their shareholders only want. And so, you know, they, they lobby, they fund misinformation campaigns, and they keep introducing all these narratives to keep people confused because the longer we're confused, the longer they're not forced to do the right thing and the critical thing during an emergency and keep the profits flowing. So, you know, so you hear narratives like volcanoes, you know, volcanoes exist, they produce CO2, how can we possibly compete with volcanoes? Well, we absolutely compete with volcanoes. We produce 60 times more CO2 than all the com volcanoes combined. You know, well, hey, you know, the earth was covered in glaciers 50,000 years ago. Where's the glaciers? Climate change is, is natural. Um, yes, climate change is natural, but it took 50,000 years for volcanoes to produce as much CO2 as the planet needed to slowly melt those glaciers. We produced that much CO2 in 250 years. You know, the difference between the natural carbon cycle that, you know, that where we break it down and we pull it back down without human intervention is about 100 gigatons a year. We produce, what are we looking at? Oh, we produce about, oh great. We produce 8% more carbon, that's not including other uh, greenhouse gases, but just 8% more carbon every year than the planet can absorb and you add it up over time and see why we now have, what is, it, what is it called now? They changed it from like ecological debt day to overshoot day, yeah. which means the day the earth can no longer regenerate any more capacity. Uh, and last year it was August 1st, this year it'll be July 29th. So July 30th onward, we're borrowing regenerative capacity from the future. So if you have children, you have grandchildren, l we are robbing the only planet that they can live on from regenerative capacity if we continue down this road. So, so to put it in the comment, that's like having an endowment and you're living off the interest, but actually you, you're basically spending the capital. Exactly. So, and once that's gone, it's gone. Right. It's a great analogy. So. There is this, you've alluded to this battle. I mean, and, and we've had this before. I mean, we always have technological transitions. You know, we've lived, many of us, have, you know, they're getting faster and faster and they're coming quicker and quicker. And we've all lived through several. And every single technological transition is different. Although there's often one commonality, which is the incumbents almost always, and there are exceptions that prove the rule, but they almost always fail to survive those technological transitions. If that was not true, you know, the cars we drive would be manufactured by those who used to manufacture steam locomotives. You know, the cameras in our phones would be manufactured by Kodak. The computers we've got would be manufactured by Olivetti, etc. Um, you know, and the incumbents always, always, you know, they rarely embrace the change. Yeah. One of my favorite stories is in the battle between the steam locomotive, the railway industry and the automobile, um, we had the red flag laws where you know, the, the railway companies managed to persuade legislators in the UK and the US and other countries to pass a law whereby if you had an automobile, you had to have someone with a red flag walk in front of it 
to warn people the car was coming. In one US state, Connecticut, I believe, they passed a law which required you, if you were driving down the road and you, you passed livestock, you had to stop, turn your car off, dismantle your vehicle, put the components behind local shrubbery until the livestock had gone, and then you could reassemble the car and continue. The governor of that state refused to sign it into law. So I guess that's nothing new. But most of those previous technological transitions, we weren't racing against a environmental, a climate clock. So to what extent you know, do we need the incumbents? Or, or for you as an entrepreneur, to what extent do you believe entrepreneurial energy, the new companies that emerge, can get us where we need to get to in terms of scaling up the technological response at the speed and scale required? So the, the entrepreneurs have done an excellent job. The investment community has done a very poor job. They have not backed the transition to the extent that it needs to be backed to meet the climate timelines. So uh, right now there's, I don't know how much, I think it's $138 trillion a year get invested in the world. And we're now investing $33 billion a year in low carbon infrastructure. And that might seem like a lot. In order just to meet the Paris Climate Accord goals or the IPCC recommendations, just in energy alone, we have to invest 2.3 trillion a year. So this is quite a deficit in what we're needing to invest compared to what we're investing. Why? Inertia. You know, there's just this inertia of you know, people who are making decisions, they're not used to learning something new they don't want to learn something new. Their information is 20 years old and dated. Ah, you know, I heard blah, blah, blah doesn't work. Really? When's the last time you heard that? 20 years ago. You know, technology has, you know, technology is ready today to uh, transform every area of industry with 21st century efficient, non-polluting infrastructure technology. So that which underpins modern civilization, our water systems, our energy systems, our transportation systems, our agricultural systems, our waste systems, all of these systems have new technology that's ready to be rolled out globally and replacing the existing polluting inefficient stuff that we have out there. But you know, we need the investment community to get updated and start redirecting capital where it needs to go. Um, and that's, that's why we're lagging. Mm. I mean, there are many, you know, not enough by far, in the investment community. It's a shame we don't have Emma, Emma Howard Boyd here. Um, you know, because so, some pension funds, for example, like the Environment Agency's pension fund, have been big, big drivers in, in the shifts we've seen. Sure. Um, but could talk a little bit about your journey. So you're a very successful entrepreneur, m multiple companies, with a real focus on this issue in, and building a business around it. So one, you know, where, where does, you know, because you don't, you know, you've made enough money, you've been successful, you, you, you could be doing many other things that could make a lot of money. Why this? Where, where does this particular interest or passion, I think, come from? Well, for one thing, making a lot of money on a planet that's dying is a fool's errand. I mean, who cares if we're the wealthiest person in the cemetery? And this is coming from somebody who, uh, who, you know, like bought into the wealth creation or wealth accumulation story hook, line, and sinker. You know, I was under the spell of it just like any other teenager who grew up, in my case, in the 80s and watched Dallas and Dynasty and Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. You know, we're all, you know, we watch what happens around us and what was happening around us is people uh, were giving all the social accolades to those with power and wealth. So I thought, if you, you know, or making money makes you a winner at life. So I became an entrepreneur and I won at life uh, in that regard. <clears throat> I was noticing the other day, uh, my, you know, first of all, I have no, like, I don't take any responsibility for being a, you know, social entrepreneur or an environmental entrepreneur. That happened with a thousand and one 
tilts in my own personal trajectory. The other day somebody asked me if art had ever influenced me and I, my initial answer was to say no, then I thought about it, then I remember listening to a Tracy Chapman song when I was 12 years old. When you're 12 years old, you're not thinking, you, the world is perfect before, like, dad can I have money, mom can I have money, I want, you know, whatever, like, it's, you're not thinking about the world at large, but you know, one of her songs on her first album had four questions that made me think, even as a 12 year old, it said, you know, the lyrics were something like, why do the babies starve if there's enough food to feed the world? Why, if there's so many of us, there are people still alone? Why are the missiles called peacekeepers if they're aimed to kill? And why is a woman still not safe when she's in her home? And I was like, a woman is not safe when she's in her home? Like, the changed my whole view of the world because there were these questions just rocked me to the core. And then you have, like, you start seeing the world differently. Like, you, know, you start going out in the world, and I was a scuba diver, I, you know, I'd, I'd go underwater to the same place, and I'd see the deterioration year after year after year. One day I went back and I saw tires, used tires, where my corals used to be. You know, I mean, and I remember thinking, like, what's the point of this trajectory that I'm on of, like, wealth accumulation? It felt so silly and futile. And then, of course, we've all heard this, you know, Native American poem that said something like, if we, you know, once the last fish is caught and the last tree is cut and the last river is dry, we're going to learn we can't eat the money. Mm. So, you know, it's a, so of course I became an environmental entrepreneur. Of course I decided to grow my wealth and my investments by investing in things that make sense, that pencil out in a finite planet. The carbon has to pencil out. We live in a closed sphere. There's no, there's, you know, we, we either live under the delusion of, uh, what is it called, the tragedy, tragedy of the commons, where I'm like, well, I'll drive a Hummer, I'll get a private jet, I'll keep eating steak three times a day, and let the rest of humanity and all the other creatures bear the consequences, but I'll have a good time. I'm sure some people can live like that. I can't do that. So yes, I started Full Cycle, and what Full Cycle does is it uh, finds what's called um, market-ready technologies, things that we can break ground on tomorrow, not you know stuff in a lab, not stuff that'll be commercialized in five, 10 years because the climate doesn't have that, stuff that's ready today. Our motto is, now is better than new. And then we back it with funding so we can accelerate its deployment worldwide as quickly as possible because we're in a race against time. So our model is designed to be an accelerant to these market-ready, low-carbon technologies that are the big ones, like the infrastructure ones, the water, waste, energy ones, because those are the ones that we have to transform ASAP because it's not our lack of recycling or you know, or our recycling that's going to make it or break it. It's the stuff that's underpinning modern civilization and time. Yeah, my, my, my song, I, I won't do the lyrics, was David Bowie's Five Years Tell uh, us. when I was growing up with. I mean, I'll, let's talk about that future because the latest IPCC report says we have 12 years to halve emissions or we potentially lock in, you know, a pretty onerous pretty sort of grisly pathway to the future. And I've been thinking a lot about what that means, because we, we've got that choice, as you say. Our, this, we are the generation that has a choice. I was fortunate enough in January to meet Greta Thunberg, and it's really left a, you know, an impact on me. Because one of the things she says in her TED talk or YouTube video is, what's the point of me going to school you know, someone said, well, why don't you study to be a climate scientist and then you can grow up and you can do something about this. And she's like, well, one, that system, those schools, those universities, that's where all the climate scientists who've been warning us for the last 30 years went and you're not listening to them. And if I do this, but I, I'll, I'll be powerless by the time I've gone through that system because it will be too late. So by the time I've qualified as a climate scientist after going through school and university, so why shouldn't I take every Friday off and actually do something about it now while we still can? And it, it almost it shouldn't be our children 
You know, my, my daughter's studying like crazy for her GCSEs at the moment, and I, I think it's great, and I'm really proud of her. But part of me is like, but, you know, she may grow up into a world where she's lost this power to control the future. And I, I, my, it breaks my heart to think of her in that situation, all of my children. And that's the psychological impact Absolutely. on them. But okay, so we've Can depressed that. One we've thing. Is anybody here a climate scientist? I'm still the, uni, though. The, well, I just, you know, I want to do like, you know, just a shout out and a thank you from us to all the climate scientists out there. They've been discredited, beaten up, hu humiliated, you know, their funding's cut. There's been so many forces in the world against them, and all they've been doing is just doing science and math and reporting the results, and they are beaten up because of the fossil fuel industry and the politicians who are in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry. So wherever they are, I just want to send out a thank you to all of them because we're all here because they've been warning us for 30 years now and we're finally listening. Three of, I mean, on my YouTube channel, I've spoken to three of them, Michael Mann, um, Catherine Hayhoe, and Professor Chris Rapley from UCL here in London. And they are real heroes. And they have been, you know, I've talked to them about how they've been attacked and abused, and some of it's quite, quite horrific. But, you know, those three particularly, and many others, keep going. But let's turn, okay, we've depressed the hell out of everybody. And quite frankly, we know that if, if you become hopeless, you know, psychologically, <laughs> you become paralyzed. So, you know, we've done the fear. We know we've got to act. But let's talk a bit about hope and optimism. So one of the other, you know, people I've spoken to on my channel is Christiana Figueres. And she's come up with this, this idea of, and it's sort of associated with her now, climate optimism. Because there, there is hope. You know, we have the technology. We have more money, more capital on the planet than has ever existed before. So it's not a case that we can't afford the transition. So how do, we, how do we roll out that technology that we have that can solve the problem at the speed and scale that is necessary? So <clears throat> I, uh, I believe the first thing we have to do is just tell the world in as many platforms as we can, as fast as we can, that the technology is there. You know, so many times people come together and go, if only somebody would invent something that does fill in the blank, whatever that is, it's invented. It's, you know, we have all the answers that we need from technology. All we have to do is just create vehicles to back those technologies in as fast a time frame as we can. So that's the good news. So you can, we can now stop saying, you know, uh, technology, you know, somebody, uh, you know, technology will save us. Uh, technology has been invented, and if technology will ultimately have to save us if we don't do the, uh, the stuff that we're going to be talking about here, we're literally going to have to put up uh, sails in space to block the sun from hitting the earth. We're going to have to start doing geoengineering, and that'll be once things get really ugly from a climate perspective. So the good news is, is we can... We have everything we need. We just have to create more and more vehicles to roll it out worldwide. So it really is, if you're in the financial industry and you control pools of capital, or you know, then we just have to direct that capital away from legacy fossil fuel investments towards you know, the, the solutions that have already been identified. And it's not just that we have the technology. So, so here's my response. So uh, they'll, they'll invest in listed companies, for example. I mean, they, everybody can do whatever they want to do, but just you can remind them that their entire portfolio is going to get its ass kicked if the planet doesn't work. So the, you know, because because our investments have an impact, either good or bad, on the planet. Well, guess what? The planet 
also has impact on our investments, good or bad. So you talk to anybody in the, real, in the insurance industry and they'll tell you, you know, what's what from a portfolio standpoint. You know, I bet you people who invested in real estate in Miami are wondering who's the greater fool they're gonna sell their real estate to now, and I bet you they can't find that fool. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I've just spent a weekend with a lot of the climate finance uh, and, and community. So people from Hermes, Legal and General, Aviva, um, you know, a range of, of others. Um, and you're absolutely right. We have the technology. It is actually now cost competitive, if not cheaper, than the incumbent technology. It is just currently not packaged as in a safe and boring way. So that wind farm in Nigeria or Jamaica or the Philippines um, or even the UK and the US, um, you've, we've now got to find a way of packaging that into companies and into in, in commoditize it in a way that it's, it's boring and it's safe and it's AAA rated in London and New York. But we're working on that and Ibrahim is, is right. The, the risks that the big oil and gas and coal companies and mining companies are facing, and they're very aware of them. They know... Um, that there's a huge amount of demand destruction as these new technologies arise. And these, the cost of these new to technologies is only going in one direction, which is, is down. Whereas the cost of getting more and more fossil fuels out of the ground and bringing it to market um, is going up. And as many of them also recognize, you know, they can't survive, they can't create these complex supply chains in a world at four or five degrees either. So, you know, they, they need to transition. But I think you know you raise a really good point. Um, mindsets are so established, and the short-termism of the of the markets makes it diff very difficult. But we have to get we have to get over that hurdle. It, you know, so the, the the problem is not that we haven't got the technology. It's not now that the technology is not cost you know cost comparable and actually in many cases a lot cheaper and more efficient. It's just the way the financial markets are structured. And as we know, though though. When that happens, financial markets hit a wall, and we all pay a price. Before we move over to Neil, um, and we hear, you know, because this is not just about climate change, as I said at the beginning. Climate change is a big issue that's going to upset the system and the way the system runs. But even if we didn't have climate change, we would be running into some very serious resource constraints. We'd have a world covered in plastic as, as we're seeing. Um, and that, you know, I think part of this change in zeitgeist has, has benefited from the people's awareness of the plastics issue. And I think this is part of a transition, and this is my view, and I'm, I'm interested in, in, in both of your views on this, where I think until recently most of us have viewed the environment as something out there. It's about the polar bears. And it's sad if a polar bear doesn't have a habitat and penguins don't have anywhere to reproduce and they're going to die out. But sadly, most of us, you know, when it comes to the day-to-day, -day, we worry about our lives and the, and the issues in the next week. Um, and we're quite selfish uh, at heart as a species. And I think what's happening is we're beginning to realise the environment's not something out there. The environment's... We're part of that environment and it's going to affect us. And that suddenly those, those beaches we want to go on holiday to or we want to go and see are covered in plastic. The sea we want to scuba dive in is covered in plastic. And even worse than that, the food that we're eating is full of plastic. The water we're drinking has got how many bits of plastic, you know, microplastic particles in it. Um, and I think actually the, the, the children who are going on these school strikes, they're suddenly realising this is about them when they grow up and the world they're going to grow up into. And people who are part of the Extinction Rebellion are beginning to realise this is, you know, an extinction crisis. It's actually about us. It's no longer just about the polar bears. Uh, but I could be wrong. I mean, do you, do you think that's part of this change? So um, I was heartened once when I was scrolling through my Facebook feed to see that the, the video of floating plastic in some bay had 145 million views and right underneath it was a Donald Trump video and it only had 4 million views. 
So I was very glad that, this, that people care about this issue enough to pay this level of attention to it. Um, so yeah, so we produce you know, 5.1 pounds of trash per person per day in the developed world. You know, it's, you know, there's one uh, garbage truck of, uh, that's being dumped in the ocean every minute of every hour of every day. Of course, our beaches are full of plastic. You know, that's say, you know, this is, we have, uh, uh, there's a sanitation problem. 70% of the world's garbage gets thrown in an open pit and it rains or, you know, and it takes that garbage right into a ravine, into a river, down into our oceans. So, you know, to some degree, yes, this has woken up the world because it's visceral. We can now see it and it really has galvanized the world around this issue. And I'm going to, you know, have you speak about it because this is, you're one of the heroes that's going to help us get out of this addiction to plastic. But I do want to address the polar bears for a second because I don't know about you, but I mean, I want to live in an, uh, uh, on a planet that has monarch butterflies and whales and hummingbirds and elephants and tigers. I don't want us to live on a planet that literally has 200 species a day dying and we're in the seventh mass extinction in history because one species can't consume enough to make even space for other species to thrive and coexist. We're just one species out of seven, 10 million species that have also taken billions of years to evolve and be here. You know, that we have no right to make everything else extinct and have the only creatures left on this planet are the ones that we, you know, either entertain us and, uh, you know, keep us from being lonely or we house them in cruel environments and kill them for food at our will and throw away 40% of the rest of the food we don't consume. We cannot be that species. We have to get out of this ever-consuming, myopic uh, civilization that we've developed. You, t you talk about YouTube, and my, I know a lot about YouTube because my children spend far too much time on YouTube. Um, and one of my, you know, so I've started this, this YouTube channel, but I'm inspired by some of the heroes my kids watch. And I, you know, what I'd love to see is this conversation between one of the YouTubers, Dan TDM, 30 million subscribers, it's probably a lot more than that now. He'll do a video playing Minecraft or Fortnite and get millions upon millions of views. Um, you know, I'd like to imagine a conversation between Dan TDM and Greta Thunberg, and I'm not quite sure how that conversation will go. Um, but I think that's the scale that we have to, that's the scale we have to reach. Um, I've got 134 subscribers, so I'm, I'm catching up with Dan TDM. <laughs> um, Neil. Hi, can I, just, can I just check you're all able to hear me around the corner? Yeah, I see some hands, fantastic. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things, but I want to come back to this concept of uh, dates. So Ibrahim mentioned uh, 29th of July this year, 2019, um, as Earth Overshoot Day, and I think that was August last year, wasn't it? So Earth Overshoot Day is when we exceed the resources that the planet is able to renew in any given year, and every year that's getting closer and closer to, to January. Uh, so we're going from single planet living to needing two or three planets to sustain life. And I think having been in sustainability for my entire professional career, trying to mobilize people on climate action has been a real uh, learning journey. Um, Copenhagen in 2009, trying to convince people with a very negative narrative, a doom and gloom, a kind of a stick-based approach that we needed to, to take action. We just failed abysmally. By the time we got to Paris in 2015, we had a much more positive can-do attitude. Um, but we also had businesses that were, were fundamentally different. In uh, Copenhagen in 2009, we had Shia Gassi's Project Better Place, which was the kind of the, the poster child of what great innovation looked like at that point in time. And to the life of me, sorry if any of you invested in that business or know Shia, but for the life of me, I didn't know how that was ever going to scale or be in any way disruptive. But in 2015, we had Tesla, 
And we have so many more examples that we can kind of point to now of disruptive technologies that are allowing us to say, let's not just put the capital here, but actually those businesses need to be run in a way that doesn't just um, disrupt from a technological perspective, you have to disrupt the entire value chain, even going beyond the value chain. And that's a very different way of running a business than the traditional um, you know, P&L oriented models of the past. Firstly, you need investors that accept the fact that you're gonna build different kind of muscles within the organization that to many of the funds out there are pretending to be SRI funds, quite, quite frankly, uh, it looks like cost. But you're going, no, no, that's how we're going to engage regulators, that's how we're going to shift policy, that's how we're going to change standards, and all of those bits will line up. And then we're going to shift consumer mindsets, and we're going to put all of that pressure on the entire system, and then our technology is going to be the one that everybody's looking for. Even SRI funds at the moment look at uh, those types of loaded costs in organizations and say, you don't need it, cut it out, you know, show us, show us the numbers. So you need to have investors, and a lot of the investment, just to give a, um, um, uh, a note of hope here, uh, from high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals who really believe um, in investing in disruptive technologies and, and playing a longer game is how businesses like Polymateria are coming into the world. So I'm gonna show you a little video, and then I'm gonna look, coming back to this concept um, of, of these important dates, the 29th of July, I'm gonna let you have that date as your special date, because I'm gonna need your help, Ibrahim, in a second. Anthony, I want you to think about a special date in the next two years from your perspective, and maybe you guys can all start thinking about Earth Overshoot Day is the 29th of July. For me, just to give you uh, some, some context from my perspective, that date for me was the 29th of October, um, 2017. 29th of October, 2017, from a plastic pollution perspective, was when David Attenborough's Blue Planet 2 aired. And we unleashed a movement which, for, for many of these uh, sustainability-related issues, I think galvanized people into, into action around how at odds we were with the environment around us that we struggle to do, frankly, on climate change and we've struggled to do with other environmental issues. But for disruptive businesses that are now trying to figure out how do we harness all of that energy into supporting and demanding um, from the biggest businesses in the world that ultimately they change, it means we need to do things differently. And in thinking about how to do that, that's where I'm gonna need all your help today as well. So let me just show you, um, to give you at least a sense of the type of technology that Polymateria has developed. Um, just for one second.
I get up in the morning, I love going to work, as you can imagine. There's nothing I've done in my life that comes close to having a technology like this um, and trying to figure out how do we take the disruptive nature of the technology into disrupting how an entire industry has made decisions for 50, if not 100 years. And that industry is the plastics industry. So um, my uh, panelists here have got one of these cups in front of them. It's traditional polypropylene. Um, so just to kind of give you some stats for a second, we make 320 million tons of plastic every year. 32% of that becomes fugitive, as in it escapes into the natural environment. So extrapolating forward from today's numbers, we wind up with about 4 billion tons of plastic in the natural environment by the year 2050. Now, in spite of media's focus on the oceans, actually the biggest issue is on land. Littering happens on land, it stays on land, and doesn't wind up in a river, doesn't wind up in the oceans. So the biggest proportion of the 32% that's leaking is food-safe, single-use packaging. Right, so that's packaging that you and I use every day to actually provide us with, with, with food, which if we put it in alternative materials at this moment in time, we create big food waste issues. We're wasting about 30% 30, 30 of food that's, that's produced in the world every year. So polypropylene is the second most littered um, type of plastic on the planet. Polyethylene um, is the biggest, but Polyethylene doesn't look as good on a stage when you hold it up in front of people, so today I'm actually showing you our solution for polypropylene. Now, what's different about this is this, this can be recycled. So you can put it into, into a recycling facility, and ideally, that's what would happen um, with this cup. But because of the work that our team of scientists that were referenced there in Imperial Innovations have put in over the last four years, they figured out how to precisely control the onset of biodegradation. So it can be as aggressive as a six month time frame. More typically though, brands who want a cup like this will say, actually no, um, we'd like people to maybe use it over and over again for a period of anything from 18 months to two years, and then it's recycled. But after that, if it becomes fugitive, we'd like it to biodegrade. So we say, fine, let's pick a moment in time that you, you think is realistic, and we'll clearly communicate that to the consumer. So. On this cup, it's time controlled to June 2021. So it's basically masked for that period of time. And of our laboratories at Imperial Innovations, we've one whole lab dedicated to getting that timing right. We're actually borrowing tools and techniques from the automotive industry. So when BMW give you a guarantee for a car bumper, they've te te uh, tested it in advanced weathering systems that allows them to say with confidence, we'll give you a guarantee for five months or, or a decade or whatever. We're using the exact same approach, except we're measuring it for um, weathering in the case of weeks and months versus decades. So we're able to get it now as precise as, as, as a month. And that allows, within that two-year time frame, the consumer to, to recycle this particular cup. But if, for whatever reason, it becomes part of that 32%, um, and a lot of that is happening not because of, of, of littering, but because of the failure of the broader infrastructure around us, the lack of sanitary landfill, the lack of recycling facilities, the lack of even composting facilities. In this country, only 4% of people have access to composting facilities in, the, in this country. So the lack of infrastructure is largely why plastic is winding up in the natural environment. So once it starts to biodegrade, this cup will start biodegrading from June 2021. Um, it then, over a period of weeks, starts to lose its structural integrity. So the polymer scientist, the eureka moment for our business, was understanding within polypropylene, you have a complex molecular structure. How do you get right into the hard crystalline regions? So if you don't attack the crystallinity of the polymer, you basically leave microplastics. So that was the starting point. But then how do you draw in all the natural agents of decay? Not just one or two, not just oxygen, not just enzymes, but bacteria, fungi, UV light, the air, moisture, through things like hydrolysis, they all play a role. You have to draw them all in to achieve full biological consumption um, of the plastic, but it can be done. So that's incredibly exciting, right? You get up in the morning to come work for a business like Polymateria, there really isn't a better thing to be doing with your time. But what you spend most of your time doing is not necessarily um, 
stacking cups like this high and, and, and selling them and figuring out how do you scale, you, figure, you try to figure out how do you disrupt um, a packaging value chain that has made decisions in a very slow fashion for 50 years of more, since the graduate film with Dustin Hoffman where he was advised, son, plastic. Plastic in 1950s America was the place to work, and that has done amazing things, but it also makes decisions at a glacial pace. So we work beyond the value chain. We open source the standards that we test to, as you see referenced in the, in the film there, where because we're so confident in the criteria we're testing to, that it doesn't create microplastic, that it's good for recycling, it doesn't harm the natural environment in any way, we share the scientific evidence that we've got in order to give confidence to others that the technology works. And the BSI, the British Standards Institute, the ASTM, CEN in Europe, they're all starting to enshrine our internal standards in what's becoming a kind of a new global standard. So we've got to resource up for that. We have to be able to create capabilities internally that allow us to do that because it's, it's critical to allow the industry to make decisions. But they're still going to take a long time to make those decisions, which is where we need your help. So one of the big things that... Um, Businesses like ours, and I mentioned Tesla just at the, at the start um, of the introduction there, are learning is the power of the crowd. So Greta Thunberg, who uh, you've both mentioned um, earlier, is an example, a poster child, if you want, for what people power is actually able to do to pr put pressures on systems. We can continue to look for little short circuits within the kind of the polymers value chain and try, try ways to short circuit things and do it quicker, and more efficiently, but ultimately there's nothing as powerful as having people demanding your products and services, just like happened with Tesla when they launched the Model 3. So um, zero above the line advertising, all word of mouth, $15 billion taken in pre-order sales, I think was, was, was last count, without a si single billboard, without a single online TV. It was fueled by people like you and I, like the people in this room, who believed in the tes Tesla mission, and in spite of everything that Elon Musk has done over the last year, probably still want Tesla to win. So that's what the power of the crowd can do. People put, um, was it, I think, $1,000 into just, so just pre-orders pre uh, each, because they really believed in the Tesla mission. They, they didn't know how good the car was going to be, but the power of the crowd was ultimately how they were disrupting Destro Detroit and some very well-established um, value chains. And businesses like Polymateria need to think exactly the same way. So one of the things that we're going to look to, firstly, Ibrahim and, and Anthony for their, for their help with, and then maybe you guys can help us, if not in the room, later on online, is this whole concept of we're all familiar with use-by dates, right? Um, you know the food is going off you know it's likely going to be a health risk, so you know not to eat it. You'll get salmonella, it's going to cause you a problem. Marks and Spencers were the first uh, retailer in the world to bring us use-by dates in 1973. But who knows the difference between composting and biodegradation and whether you put it in the brown bin or whether you can um, you know, leave it outside. We're all confused by that. So what about taking what we've learned from use-by dates and now having recycled-by dates on packaging. So with our technology and our ability to actually time control it, we can allow that tension that used to exist be between recycling and biodegradability to go away, and we can set a clear time frame within which this now has a shelf life. It's obviously longer than the food that sits with ins inside it, but ultimately, it allows us to know what to do with this within a certain period of time. So for the very first time today, we're actually starting through the COGX crowd to look for people to demand recycle, recycle by dates on packaging like this. And one of the ways that we're actually engaging all of you and making it somewhat emotional and personal, which frankly, sorting out the recycling is a lot of things, but it's not emotional and, and, and it's certainly not personal. So, we want you to think of a date, and we want you to think of a date that ultimately um, you will recycle this by. And then we want you to share that with everybody, and we want you to start to mobilize the crowd to ultimately put a lot of that pressure on the brands and the packaging companies 
um, that are taking incredibly long time to make decisions and give power back to consumers. So I'm going to get a pen out of Joy. Can I just get a pen out of my top left pocket there? I'm going to get three pens, actually. And don't worry, Anthony, I'm not going to take um, much longer than about 10 seconds if I can grab these pens. I think we'll go... We've got 10 minutes left, so after that we'll go to some questions because yeah. I'm sure the audience would like to... So you've thought of your date? <sighs> it's complicated. Ibrahim, we know you've got your date. <laughs> so this is my recycle by commitment. On these cups, I'm looking... I'm going to say that I'm going to recycle these cups by... I said the 29th of October is the anniversary of Blue Planet, 2019. So that's the date that I'm going to recycle this cup by, and I'm going to share that on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn later on. And over the course of today, if you just look for our recycle by as a hashtag in all of those platforms, all kinds of very interesting and influential people are starting to do the same. And it's really engaging people and making an emotional connection with recycling that, frankly, we've never had before. So, Ibrahim, are you going to change from the 29th of, uh, of July, or are you sticking with that one? I'm going to keep it in, in the tweet that's going to go out soon after we're done to 50,000 people, and I'm going to uh, use the July 29th date to make sure that people also hear about Overshoot Day. Great. So you guys don't have to have one of these. There is a thousand of these at this festival, so they are floating around at all the different um, speaker platforms. But you can also just use, go find any packaging. If you live in the Shires, if you live anywhere in the UK, you'll, you'll just see it in the motorways at the moment. Pick it up, <coughs> write hashtag recycle by on it, post the date. That means something to you. Why, why does that date mean something to you? Is it, is it an anniversary? Is it uh, something a little bit more cliched like I've chosen? Um, and, and tag the brand. Tag the brand that's not, that's not taking responsibility for the full value chain and call it out. Um, Anthony, what's your date? I'm going to go for the... Well, I thought of my children's birthdays, but I've got seven. I don't want to show favoritism. <laughs> I it's thought a about very my, small label. I thought about my wedding anniversary, but I'm not quite sure it's the right message, recycle or degrade. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go... I'm going to push it to the limit, the 10th of June... 2021, the full two years. Because I'm, I'm, I would love to see what happens <laughs> two years from now. Okay, and send it out. I will, I will. Good, well we've got a few minutes left. That was great. And I want to see if, the, if anyone's been bursting to ask a question. There's one, there's two. So let's take three, because it's going to be more efficient. So um, there was two on this side and one here. So the first person, both, do, you, do you both want to stand up? There's two of you. There was someone in front as well. So you first, so name, affiliation, and the question, not a statement, please. And then... And the question behind... Yep, uh, my name is Ed, uh, uh, and um, we know that there's a concept called Devon's Paradox. The more efficiently we consume it, we produce the more, we the use. more of the results we end up consuming. Uh, we can have LED light bulbs on everywhere, and we need them all. Um, is that something that we need to look to, and how can we put a stop gap in the future, and how, how can we say, we know that we Okay, so the more efficient we become, the more we use. The first question was about the, the rights, the, the equi equitable rights of the developing world to develop, have, you know, develop their lifestyles. And the question here, please. Johnny, can we get to the one on the side, please? 
Hi there, my name is Alex. I'm actually a filmmaker, so this is all new to me about AI, but it really connects with me because I think um, film can be, uh, videos can be so important to educate people. And, and seeing my three year old son, he knows how to use YouTube, and half the time he's watching crap stuff because there's so much on there. But my question is, is that do you think social media, schools, even like companies, you know, like Pixar and stuff like that, do you think they've got an important role to play in this? To, Educate, because at the end of the day, it's it's their generation ahead of them that's going to be affected. And if more of them, even from a young age, can start processing what is going to happen with all the things without even trying to shock and fear them, but just gradually make them realise that, you know, by them being educated by this, that could have some impact. Because it's definitely not going to be the likes of like Trump's, you know, people or people like that. Like you said, is it Ibrahim? Ibrahim, sorry. Yeah, you, when you're saying about the money and stuff, when it just comes across to every single person on this planet, that's what it's, who's it going to affect. So. so the power of social media and young people. So, who wants to, who wants to start? So the, um, uh, Ronnie, I believe your question was, how do uh, developing countries, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, China, uh, uh, Egypt, uh, a lot of countries in Africa, you know, the, how do they reconcile the, uh, the wealth accumulation spell? So they don't have to, uh, they don't have to reconcile it. They're, the good news for them is just like they transitioned uh, right from um, landlines, like they never had landlines, right? Like a lot of these countries just skipped right to mobile. Yeah. So they don't have to build a fossil fuel infrastructure. They don't have to build a coal plant to get energy. They have you know, wind and solar that costs less money. So they can build their energy infrastructure with that, that's carbon neutral. They can, already China is the number one producer of electric cars. They didn't have to go and build combustion engines and then transition to electric transportation. So they're in a very positive spot where the economics are favorable to them, where they can just skip over all the mess that we've created. So, you know, they're, you know, and they're, and they're doing it anyway. So thankfully that's the case. There's a lot of work, Carbon Track has done some work on this. It shows, you know, it's cheaper to give people energy using clean energy. IRENA, which is the kind of international renewable energy body, did a piece recently called the New Geopolitics of Energy that showed most developing countries will be better off because they won't have to spend a huge amount of money importing fossil fuels from those few countries that were lucky enough, you know, to be deposited with them. Um, Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think we've, we haven't got much time left, so we can't probably get into a full discussion as much as we would like to, and I think there's time afterwards to come and talk to the speakers. But I think this is why these, these new, um, you know, non-meat meats are one of the biggest areas of investment in Silicon Valley um, at the moment, because we can't all eat meat in the traditional form. If we do, you know, we all, we all suffer together, so there has to be a change um, in lifestyles. Maybe Niall wants um, to talk Film producer, your name, sorry. Uh, Alex. Alex, so um, you're the missing link, actually, and, and there's been some amazing examples of where we've got it right in parts, but not everything together at the same time. So Coney 2012 is one of the case studies that I, I kind of talk about a lot, where you'd amazing, you mentioned your three-year-old son, but Coney 2012 was about that film producer's nine-year-old son in California and the relationship he had with someone who wound up becoming a childhood militia ultimately in Joseph Coney's army. Um, and it drew everybody in. I think they got 120 million views with inside 72 hours, Coney 2012, but it was, it was flawed. I think Joseph Coney was the wrong person <laughs> to be targeting. So unless you have integrity with creative and real um, 
savvy around how you build social movements, it, it falls over. So there's Avatar is an amazing example of News Corp taking James Cameron and others and just sharing clim climate facts, climate science with their creative network. And James Cameron came up with Avatar. He said, I want to make a blockbuster to relay all of this. And Avatar was now put of that process. So we, 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 we're still not doing it enough to counter what's going on on the other side at the moment, but you are the missing link. So we should talk afterwards. <laughs> there was one person whose question didn't get answered and I forgot what it was. Ed. The, what was the question? The, the Jevons Paradox question. Oh, yes, get more efficient, we use more. So, so in the US, um, we actually plateaued. Our energy consumption plateaued. Our population is growing. And the reason is because we started to use a lot more efficient um, light bulbs. You know, we transitioned from coal to uh, um, natural gas, unfortunately, but that's better than coal. So there's a, so even though we're consuming more energy, our CO2 emissions have flattened. So that's just, you know, at least the technology is helping on that front. We're not su somehow, you know, even though with our, all our extra iPads and electric cars and whatever, we're plugging everything in and we have a billion data centers popping up in every corner, so our CO2 emissions have uh, plateaued. Well, I think just that's a good point to finish on, actually, because we can, we can bring in AI. Um, <laughs> you know, glo globally, energy demand, I mean, energy demand is still growing at a massive amount, sadly, but in the 20th century, it grew on average between 2 and 3% per annum. As an average since the beginning of the 21st century, energy demand has, has gone down, the growth in energy demand has gone down to about 1% as an average. And that's because of this massive leap forward in energy efficiency. And you know, the good news already, and it's growing, it's growing fast, renewables already has 50% of that growth every year. And we think by 2025, 2030, renewables will, have, will be 100% of all energy demand growth. So that's the good news. Now, I was told an anecdote. I was away at a retreat of the climate finance community over the weekend, and I was told an anecdote. You know, we were talking about AI, and I said, God, can someone tell me about AI? I've got to, talk, I've got to ch chair a panel on Monday. And there was a piece that came out recently about how AI is being used in this context. And in this facility, uh, I think it was a storage facility where they use a huge amount of you know, air cooling and air conditioning, um, they thought you know, they had four big air coolers. And when it got you know, when they wanted to try and be more efficient, and they didn't need them all. They'd just have one running at full throttle. Um, and then they put an AI energy efficiency management system in, and it's worked out. You don't run one at full throttle. You run all four at 10%, and that's much more energy efficient. And the humans hadn't clocked on to that. And it, the AI, within the first sort of day of, of being turned on, um, immediately shifted the whole way they did it and sort of cut, you know, the energy demand of that facility dramatically um, as a result. So I think... That's the good. That's the potentially the good news if we use AI in the right way, and that's I think a good way to to end the panel. Thank you. Thank you.